Do you have your piano tuned regularly but still find that it's not as satisfying as you want it to be? Maybe you don't like its tone or you feel like you're fighting the action and it's getting the upper hand. Using my latest project, a Baldwin Model M, I'll talk about some of the things that can be done to a piano beyond tuning to help you fall in love with it again. Think of it as couples therapy for you and your piano. Granted, tuning is by far the most impactful thing that we can do for our pianos. But expecting a piano to be at its best with tunings alone is a bit like expecting a car to win the Indy 500 when all the mechanics do is change the oil. Pianos are machines, and like any machine, they need periodic adjustment to work their best. They have hundreds of moving parts which suffer a great deal of impact and motion. It's a given that with use or even neglect, a piano will go out of adjustment. Consider also that the final transfer of key motion to the strings is performed by a piece of wood wrapped in felt. Felt is fragile, ever-changing, and vulnerable to impact. Depending on the condition of the hammers, they can either bring our deepest musical feelings to life or stand defiantly in their way. What follows is an overview of the deeper work that can be done to a piano. I think at the very least you'll find it very interesting, uh, and if you're not satisfied with your piano, it just might help you diagnose what your piano needs. The adjustment of the piano's action parts is called regulation, and the manipulation of the hammer felt to elicit a desired tone falls under the heading of voicing. These two procedures join with tuning to form what could be called the triad of piano care, and they are intimately interconnected. When I'm busy regulating or voicing a piano and someone walks by and says, ah, tuning the piano, eh? I just smile and politely nod my head. But it's important for you as a piano aficionado to understand the distinct areas of service. If your piano doesn't feel right, it probably needs regulation. If the piano doesn't sound like you want it to, it probably needs voicing. I say probably because, again, these different realms are interconnected, impacting each other in sometimes very surprising ways. The bottom line is that for a piano to reach its greatest heights, it needs to receive generous amounts of refinement to both the touch and the tone. Tuning is not enough. I was reminded of this fact during my latest project, this Baldwin Model M. By the way, this piano was an instrument I listed on my website, InsidePianos.com. If you'd like to join my mailing list and be notified when my pianos become available, there's a link in the show notes. So when I received this Baldwin, I could tell I had a well-built, well-designed piano, uh, whose wear was light enough that I really didn't need to replace any parts. But was it pleasurable to play? We've all met this piano. We'd be happy to come across it as a rehearsal instrument or at a church that we're subbing at, but we wouldn't really relish the idea of playing a solo recital on it or want to be left alone so that we could dive into all our favorite pieces. It was functional, but not inspiring or pleasurable. Again, it didn't need new anything. It was a well-built instrument in great condition. It just needed time and attention to details, lots and lots of it. Having tuned the piano, I went on to address the regulation. Now, action parts are fitted with a bunch of adjustments that we'll get to in just a bit. But if you want the potential to get the piano into top condition, you start by attending to the keys. First, the keys are leveled. I use a nifty bar made by Wessel, Nickel & Gross that helps you create either a flat surface with the keys or a very slight arch, which counteracts the wear of the most commonly played notes. I happen to be a curve guy. Paper or cardboard punchings of varying thicknesses are slipped onto the balance rail of each key, bringing it to the proper height. From there, a technician will set the key dip, how far the key goes down before stopping, to a very precise degree, again using paper punchings. It took a good while, but now I knew that I could regulate the action parts above the keys without there being any false premises, namely too much or too little key motion. So let's take a more detailed look at the main action adjustments and the implications that they have for your piano's performance, specifically a grand piano. We'll take a look at let off first. And this is the point in the keystroke at which the hammer disengages from the action. So I'm pressing the key down and at a certain point, you can see that the hammer drops a little bit. And this is so that it doesn't get jammed up against the string, but rather 
drops away right before touching it. We usually shoot for about a sixteenth of an inch below the string for let off. Uh, maybe making it a little bit wider for the bass section uh, because those strings just vibrate more, more wildly. If the let off does not occur before the hammer hits the string, then you'll have the hammer actually preventing it from vibrating. So if you're having that issue with your piano, it very likely is the let off. More often though, as parts where the let off gets further and further below the strings. And this can be that frustrating feeling where you just, you're trying to play soft and the note doesn't sound. So uh, let off is such an important adjustment because it allows for that control all throughout the dynamic range. The next adjustment I'm going to show you has a more subtle impact on the action, and that's the level to which the, the hammer drops, and that is called the drop. Imaginatively enough, again, with time, this tends to get further and further from the string. And again, it should be about a sixteenth of an inch. So the drop determines the plane at which the action can recock itself for another, another strike. It's easy to imagine that if that point were down low, you just wouldn't have as much control with trills or fast repeated notes. So if that's a problem that you're having, it could very well be that the drop is excessive. Once again, it should be pretty minute, about sixteenth of an inch. Okay, moving on to the repetition lever spring. You can see this kind of odd shaped spring that's Im embedded in the whippin assembly. This is responsible for recocking the action. I'm going to get this action to check, that is, have the hammer go against the back check here, and you'll notice that as I l let the key rebound, the hammer is going to spring up. See that? Do that again. So the hammer is moving up while, I'm, while the key is actually moving up as well. This is one of the ways in which the grand action is so uh, ingenious. Uh, it allows for quick repetition. You don't even have to let the key return to resting height to play another note. We want this spring action to be rapid, but not too jumpy. If, as you slowly release the keys, you just sort of feel this extra thump in, that's happening in the key, it could be that your repetition lever spring is too jumpy as if you didn't have enough to worry about. So on your piano, you can test this by getting the, getting the hammer to check and then slowly letting the key return. If your hammer fails to come up at all, that means that your action is going to be very poor at uh, re-engaging for another note. You'll find that trills, repeated notes, um, fast Alberti patterns uh, will not be very manageable. And then, as I mentioned before, if it's too, too jumpy, you'll actually feel that in the key. Also, you might have a bobbling effect. If this spring is too tight, it will also prevent, oftentimes, uh, the, the hammer from checking against the back check, because there's just too much tension uh, pushing the hammer up. A complete regulation requires a lot of other tasks that I don't have time to go into right now, but what I just showed you are some of the aspects of regulation that are pretty easy for you to check on your own. Back to you, Ben. The Baldwin responded really beautifully to this complete regulation, and along with the tuning, it had become elevated quite a bit. But as is true for maybe 95% of the pianos out there, its tone was too bright and harsh. It was now time to voice the piano. It is considered essential to voice a piano only if it's in tune and in proper regulation. Because if you're trying to assess the tonal quality, you don't want to be thrown off by an opening out of tune or improperly functioning. I started by making sure that each hammer struck uh, all the strings of a given note at the same time. This is called mating the hammer. And I do that with this special block that I've made. You can see that the strips of sanding paper are meant to remove the hammer felt from underneath only one string. Then I did some deep needling to create more give in the hammer, balancing the array of overtones and gaining more of the fundamental pitch. 
the piano no longer sounded bright and shallow. Uh, and if your piano lacks sustain, this, this type of needling might help with that as well. Here I am sugaring the hammers, ridding them of that ping that tends to build up with lots of play. Sugaring involves very controlled stabs near the crown of the hammer, or in extreme cases such as this, actually on the crown. Voicing really is a fascinating topic, um, probably the most artistic of our triad of piano care. Maybe in the future I'll make a video uh, entirely on that topic. But for now, I really want you to hear this piano, and I chose a piece that requires a great deal of control and nuance. So even though you're not able to play the piano yourselves, uh, you might get a sense of what it can do. It's a type of piece that is either a real sublime experience or honestly kind of a drag, depending on how the piano responds. I give you Debussy's prelude, The Girl with the Flaxen Hair, played on a Baldwin Model M that was recently tuned, voiced, and regulated. If my channel has been helping you become the next level piano nerd you want to be, then please like and subscribe. And if you really want to support the content that I'm creating, you can buy me a coffee using the link in the show notes. See you next time we open the lid on another episode of Inside Pianos.